Thank you all very much for coming today. Uh, my name is Lisa Goldman. I direct the um, Israel-Palestine Initiative here at New America. But before that, uh, I was an impecunious uh, journalist living in Tel Aviv. And uh, at one point, uh, Noam Shezaf, who's sitting here in, in the middle, uh, had coffee with me and a few other people, because that's where you do business in Tel Aviv, is at a cafe. And uh, we were all bloggers at the time. And he said, why don't we bring our bloggers all under bring our blogs all under one, under the auspices of one blog, and we'll call it something. We changed names a few times. Finally, 9721, no one thinks it's the worst name in ever, but uh, it stayed. And uh, it was just uh, you know a few Tel Aviv journalists and writers who were blogging for a hobby who came together. And Noam had a lot of vision at the time, and I, I think none of us had any expectations. Um, but about six months after we launched, just going on five years now, um, we emailed each other hysterically and said, the New York Times just cited us. Uh, and uh, fast forward, and we're now, I now know, um, find that in New York and in DC and in Boston, I never have to explain to anybody what 917 Magazine is. Um, and um, we now have a Hebrew version, which is not the same thing, but it's a sister version called Local Call. And Yael Marom is here. She's one of the co-editors. And moderating the conversation, we have Muna Shikaki, who is the DC correspondent for uh, Al Arabiya, the, news, the international Arabic language news, uh, news outlet. And she's going to be talking to uh, Yael and Noam today about various aspects of emerging media in Israel, the impact it's having, and I'll let them take it away. And um, we'll have questions at the end, so hold off. Thank you so much. Lisa. All right, so when I first was approached to moderate this panel, my response was, Israeli left? Why are we talking about the Israeli left? I thought the Israeli left was immigrating to Germany. Isn't that what, we're, that we, what we've been reading? Um, and so basically, as we see Israeli society mo move rightwards, as we see a lot more discrimination, not just against Palestinians, but also against Palestinians with Israeli citizenship, um, where does 972 Magazine, and I'm going to start with you, Noam, because 972 just was uh, uh, founded earlier than, um, than Local Call. Where do you fit in? the Israeli kind of media landscape and the political landscape? Well, um, thank you. And uh, I think that uh, the Israeli left is, is in a transitional moment. I think that uh, we, we definitely reached uh, within what you call here a progressive community and we call the left back there. Uh, we reached a, 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 a moment of crisis between the Second Intifada and um, the Second Intifada and the rise of Netanyahu's government. Netanyahu is now the longest-lasting prime minister Israel had uh, since uh, its founding father David Ben Gurion. And uh, you mentioned the right-wing movement that the media also felt, and and. Uh, and I think that the left is looking for the institutions and for the platforms that could, uh, where it could not just express itself, but come together uh, to bring about a coherent narrative. And I think this is what 972 and Local Call are about. They're about finding a new narrative to the left that deals with some of the difficulties that we saw in the past, like the, the failure of the peace process, the feeling that the diplomatic process is just you know, banging your head on a brick wall again and again and uh, the need to re-engage in new ways between the Israeli left and the Palestinian society, the need to highlight uh, uh, grassroots leaders within both societies, and all that, uh, I think that it's not just the left who missed it, the Israeli media as a whole missed these stories, and this is something we want to we achieve in our sites. So gi give us some examples of some of these stories that you feel that the mainstream Israeli press or even Western press is kind of missing. Well, I'll give you one of the, one of the first stories that, one of the first big stories that developed around 972, one of the stories that suddenly we found ourselves cited uh, around the world. There is a, in, in, the, in the Palestinian villages uh, along the path of Israel's security barrier wall, uh, uh, there are weekly protests taking place, uh, unarmed protests, uh, nonviolent protests for most part, which were met with heavy violence from, uh, uh, from Israel. And I remember uh, one specific call, I think it was three years ago, for uh, protesters to come and, and to mark like an annual day of resistance to the, to the wall. And the army at the time was blocking the entrances and the exits to the village. So as we were traveling there, um, 
I saw a CNN car turned away and the, and the reporters just left the scene. But myself and a few other bloggers, because we knew the community of protesters, we simply got and hiked on foot through the valleys to the village of Bill Inn. In this particular protest, a Palestinian protester died out of tear gas inhalation. And um, a national drama, if you want to say, emerged around the circumstances of the death with the army pushing a certain narrative and the Palestinians are trying to uh, push their own narrative into the Israeli media, which is not always uh, that acceptable to a Palestinian narrative. We had four bloggers, no less, on the scene, because they, uh, these are the stories that interest us. And almost all of them wrote their experiences that we timed the moments that we saw the tear gas fire, the ambulance come in, and all that. And we were able to fact check the, army F, the, the, the army's version on, on that and to come out with what we think was the adequate version that was here, and we were the only journalists present there. So I think that if the media is today as a whole embedded with military, is embedded with political institutions, we try and be embedded with the communities we speak about, and that was one of our first successes. Real interesting. And uh, Yael, I wanted to ask you also about uh, Local Call. It was founded in a way that's kind of unique. Um, tell us how it was founded and tell us kind of what void you felt there was in coverage and how you filled that void. So I think we've, we've started around a year and a half ago. Uh, I've joined Just Vision uh, and we're trying to um, find ways to highlight the nonviolent or non uh, unarmed struggle uh, in the Israeli media. Uh, I was working with uh, journalists for many years around that and it was very tough to make them understand what's going on on the ground. And as you know, media is tend to show just the violence or the things you can show as picture. And showing someone marching or chanting or just saying um, um, nonviolent uh, messages is not something that you can see usually in any television or in any outlet, in any news outlet. Uh, I was trying to find a way um, to bring those voices um, directly to Israeli uh, readers. Um, and started to reach a research a little bit uh, and find out that there is a gap, there is a, a lack of, of this kind of platform that will allow these voices to, to come directly, to, to bring themselves directly to Israeli readers. Uh, during this research, I find out that uh, 972 um, guys are, were, lo were talking about the same idea and it was very, very uh, obvious that we're going to just try to do it together and we started it um, with uh, as a pro as a joint project of just vision uh, 972 and active steels which which is a collective of photographers that are uh, covering what's going on in israel and palestine for for, for many many years um, i think that um, what you can see in the israeli media is is the reality that israelis get from the israeli media is different than what's going on on the ground how so um, Noam's example is very good, but, but let's talk, uh, let's take an example of what's happening in the last few days in, in East Jerusalem. Um, Israelis get what's going on in East Jerusalem right now as, a, as a, an isolated story, as a story that is not related to any history and is not going anywhere. Uh, what's going on now is just happening now, and, and, and it's all incidents. Um, and I think that what we are trying to do is to, to uh, bring things into context. Into context. So if, if we're looking about what's going on right now in Jerusalem, you can relate it. It's, it all started uh, when the uh, unity government uh, uh, started, the unity Palestinian government started, and Israel uh, didn't accept it. Then there was uh, the, the disappearance of three uh, uh, young boys Israeli young boys that were killed, and then everything started in the West Bank and went through uh, the Gaza war. But Israelis just get it as there was Gaza war, there was uh, the, the kidnapping, there was something going on in Jerusalem, it, and it's not one story uh, that have like a beginning or history. And this is what we're trying to do on local call to bring the context to, context to, to Israelis. Um, and so how do you feel uh, you're perceived in uh, Israel by Israeli media or Israeli readers? Who's reading you? Um, so we, we, tr we started um, by expecting a very small 
group of people that will follow us. And, and we were amazed to realize that there are so many people just looking for, for source of inf information that will speak with other, vo other voices or other words that they are uh, used to. Um, we were aiming for our choir, our own circles at the beginning, but we see that they are echoing everything. And during the war, it was very, very uh, obvious that people were looking for places, uh, for, for information that they can't get anywhere else. Uh, we had a huge amount of traffic um, and, and huge amount of uh, reactions coming from Hebrew readers um, 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 that are um, Jewish readers, Palestinian readers from inside Israel, people from abroad, Israelis that left and, and, and live abroad. Um, and I think that uh, whenever we're going to places where there is a community that, that is struggling, they know that they have someone that can listen to them. This is the reactions we're getting from the street. Noam, uh, 972 Magazine has also been covering other issues, not just, relating to the, not just related to the Israeli-Palestinian kind of conflict uh, and activism, things related to um, the Israeli society itself, activism within, within the Israeli yeah. society on other kind of social justice, perhaps, yeah, issues. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, f first, you know, for us, it's all connected to the same stories. Uh, um, when you hear stories about Israel and Palestine here, or when I read it, read about it in the American media, for example, you, you get the image of like two countries that has some sort of border dispute between them. And for some reason, some grand failure, nobody is able to solve this border dispute. And if we just send the right diplomats and replace the buffet or something, then we can get it done. And you, you see this kind of thinking with every administration. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you something about Israel I grew up, well, before the, this year. And, and the Israel I grew up in has one border in the Jordan River and one border in the Mediterranean. <laughs> and it's a country where different communities are totally mixed. And Jews and Arab live together along the coastline in my city in Tel Aviv. They live together in Haifa, they live together in Jerusalem, and, and they're in the Nakeb, Negev. So, and in the West Bank, today they live together because of the success of the settlement project where now every fifth person in, this, in the West Bank is, a, is an Israeli Jew. So the communities are totally mixed. And I'm not saying uh, anything about solutions, about uh, one state or two states or that. Any solution is still possible politically. What I'm saying about the political reality we live in it's a multicultural society. It's a, it's a multi-religious society. It's a, it's a, it's a different eth ethnicity, a different Jewish ethnicity. It, Palestinians are perceived here as a bunch of Arab Muslims who happen to live in the old Palestine. But they, they are Christians. And, 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 and within Israeli society, there is a multitude of voices. Like, they are quarter of a million Israeli so-called Jews were, who are Christians because they immigrated from the Soviet Russia. So, so there are all kind of unique stories happening everywhere. And, and, and we try, we try what we see is to tell the reality of each community as it is. And, and maybe for, for a single moment to put aside the political construction that we've been trained to think with and, and just tell the stories of people on the ground. And we do that through the format of blogging and through the format of, of letting people speak from the, for themselves, because that's also something that separates us from the old media. When in the media you have this perception that the military reporter sits, sits outside the camp of the basic training and get the stories there, and the education reporter is going between schools and hear teachers and students about what's going on. I worked in a newspaper, and they all sit in Tel Aviv and get phone calls from the government in Jerusalem. So, uh, um, so we try to create a model in which stories come from, from beneath. And then we can speak about the experience of Mizrahi Jews, Jews of Sephardi, of Arab region, who, who face a cultural and a structural discrimination issues, or, or, and any other story that could emerge. 
Uh, yeah, and let's talk a little bit about um, the boycott and divestment movement. There's kind of several levels to it. So there's, you know, there's the people who call for boycotting of Israeli settlement product, and then there's people who say we should boycott all Israeli products within that movement. And then there are people who go to the extent of saying we should boycott Israeli academics or universities and media. As somebody who's trying to cover uh, these you know, some of the same communities that are calling for this boycott, how does it impact your ability to get vo these voices to write, consume what you produce? So I'm going to start before launching. Before we launched Local Call, basically it was very hard to explain to people what we're aiming and what is the political um, uh, background and what we're trying to achieve. Uh, and, and first I'm going to say that uh, the BDS movement and, and, and all these practices are a uh, um, legitimate practice uh, that is non using nonviolence means, and this is something that is, is um, um, something we're trying to cover uh, as widely as we can. Uh, it's a very important part from the Palestinian struggle right now, and we are not trying to, set to say what is right and what is wrong for the Palestinian struggle. We're just trying to give space to these voices, to let them speak for themselves without, you know, Israeli media will cover what is threatening Israel. Israeli media is not covering the struggle, the movement, uh, debate around it. Um, it was very hard uh, at the beginning for Palestinians from inside Israel, for the from the occupied territories, um, to say that they will cooperate with us. But um, we see now after we launch and after people can see what we are doing, it's much easier for, for some. And for others, it's not, and it's really OK. Um, there are people that should speak with their communities. And we have the, obliga the obligation in Hebrew to speak to our community first. And, it's, and, and you know, Palestinians should speak with their communities first if this is what they, they choose to do. Um, we're trying to be uh, honest and fair and, and not jud judgmental and not just um, report about everything to the lens of Israelis. Um, and I think that this is very, um, very important and, and it's an opportunity because what you see in, is in Israeli media is just, and this is generally uh, what defines the way Israeli media um, um, is, is how Israeli media is treating uh, Palestinians through the eyes of what they are doing to us. And, and we're trying to say it's not all about us. The story is not just Israelis and what they are doing or not doing to us. It's not just foreign news and how it affects us. Um. I want to jump in and say something about that. I worked in, uh, in, in various Israeli publications. I started in a local paper in Tel, in Tel Aviv called Ha'il. Then I worked on Ynet. Then I worked on Ma'ariv. And, and it was like 12 years. And during this period of time, I worked with one Palestinian in Ha'ir paper in the 90s, and one Palest a single Palestinian in, in Ynet. And it was the same guy. He moved from the first paper to the, to the other one. So um, Palestinian voices are absent from the Hebrew conversation. And, and in 972, in local call, we don't have the equal representation of 50-50, but, but I, I do work on a daily basis with more Palestinian that I ever encountered in media. So there's a lot of work to be done on trust between the two communities, but the, the, the experience we have not right now is that we're doing something new that we couldn't have done before. So let me also ask you about um, US coverage of Israel versus Israeli coverage of Israel. Um, I think a lot of people think that American press is not as critical of Israel as Israeli press is. Um, how, how do you see the difference between the two kind of, uh, the two presses? And if you want, you can kind of tie that into whatever issues yeah. are, are going on right now, whatever news events you think uh, are relevant. Um, well, I always hear this, this line saying, you can write in Aaretz and you can write in wine at things that you cannot write in, in, uh, in the New York Times or in the Washington Post. Uh, I think there's a lot of element, uh, a strong element of style to it. If you know Israelis, they speak a bit differently in terms of uh, uh, personal engagement than, than the American uh, uh, tradition of you know, treating politicians and that. So, so I think that um, 
if you clear aside the style, I think that um, the Israeli narrative has strong access to stakeholders in the conversation here. And Explain that more. I think that Israelis find it fairly, even if, even in a time of controversy, like, you know, we've been hearing about the controversy right now <laughs> between the two administrations, and I believe this controversy is real. Chicken Be gate. Yeah, that, yeah exactly. <laughs> And I think, I think that, you know, I think there's not much love right now between the senator from Jerusalem and, and <laughs> people here at the White House. But, 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 but even at this time, if you, if you, if you, fr the conversation is framed around, around questions which are highlighted by Israelis and by Israelis media. The Israeli narrative plays a very, a very big part in, 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 framing, in framing the debate, in, in access to, to the pages, even if the New York Times is critical of, of Mr. Netanyahu. Um, for example, I think that we, we can see the prominence of the issue of security uh, uh, highlighted among, uh, in the talk, where um, the diplomatic aspect of the conflict, which is something Israel always go back to, uh, if if the Palestinians do that, that will ha uh, um, will um, torpedo the peace process, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, I think that a lot of the Palestinians' experience of life is absent from the conversation here. Uh, um, for Palestinians, it's not so much a question of war and peace. That's something I learned in the last five years when I, when I actually spoke to Palestinians and went to Palestinian visit. It's, it's, it's a question of civil rights, of human rights, of freedom to travel, uh, the fact that you need, you know, when you start working with Palestinians, you realize that the person can't come to a meeting because he's dependent on, 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 a, on a clearance from the security authority. And, and suddenly, and you go to the West Bank, and, and the Palestinian guys say, I can't tweet this because we have no G3 network in the West Bank because, that's the, because Israel is not authorizing G3 network to the Palestinian population. <laughs> so I don't know if G3 network is a human right. I think it is, but, <laughs> but uh, in my generation at least. <laughs> but but, um, but you, it's, you go back to the, to the real fundamentals of, of freedom to build a home outside Area A, uh, and, and the freedom to, uh, to, the right to property. You know that the army has the right to confiscate, without giving any reason, Palestinian property. And the military commander has used it for 100 times in a in the single year uh, private property. So, so I would like to, in 972, I would like to speak about these problems in a new language, not because I don't want to listen to the Israeli side. The Israeli side is still my, my experience of life, but because this, this is real life. Uh, yeah, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, mainstream Israeli media. How do you think it's changed, whether it's, uh, you know, covering this, uh, covering the Palestinians and the Palestinian issue and the, the conflict, the, the wider Arab-Israeli uh, conflict. You can go back as far as you want till today. Is it getting worse? Is it getting better? I don't know about worse and better. I, I'm not sure that these are the right definitions, but you see that uh, let's, ta let's take uh, Gaza as a test case. Uh, Israeli journalists can enter Gaza, can't enter Gaza since, uh, since Israel left Gaza. It means that Israeli journalists don't have uh, direct access to any stories that are happening on the ground. They are depend on, on the um, Israeli military, uh, on the authorities, or maybe on reports coming from human uh, rights uh, organizations, but they don't know the people on the ground. Um, it was very, very obvious in the last war wh when uh, Israeli journalists entered Gaza just with uh, the Israeli army on a short break, uh, on a short ceasefire that uh, uh, there was during the war. Um, this, is, this is on one hand. On, on the other hand, uh, you see that the, there is um, the connection between uh, Israeli journalists and, and people on the ground, even in the West Bank. Um, is 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 very distance. Um, 
it's very hard. There is lack of trust coming from Palestinians, and, and, and uh, it's very obvious why. Because every time when Palestinians, or many times when Palestinians are speaking with Israeli media, they don't know how the media will frame it later on. It means that you can say whatever you want, but then the editor will decide about a completely different uh, uh, headline, and it will change the whole message. Uh, so trust is, is something that is very uh, shaky right now, I think. Um, it means that all the reports, most of the reports, um, and we can hide, we can say a few, like uh, we always have Amira Haas that reports from the ground, but there are the, the just one Amira we have. Um, and I think that uh, it means that it all, everything that Israelis report, read about um, Palestinian coming through uh, the Israeli journalists' eyes. Um, the other thing that you can see is that the truth is coming only from the government or the army. So um, it means that um, if something is happening, if someone shot someone, it, it didn't happen until the army approved that it happened and what happened there. Um, and if there are two versions, the version of the Israeli army would be the truth and the other would be according to Palestinian sources, meaning that maybe they are not telling the truth for now. Um, so um, if, if you look, uh, and, and I, I want to say one more thing, not just about um, uh, how the Israeli media is covering Palestinians. The, the gatekeepers or the main, uh, um, 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 the leading journalists, most of them are um, male, Jewish, white, from uh, middle uh, or high class. And this is what the, the um, life uh, experience is uh, leading them to um, report in, in a way that I can't expect a man to report about women through women's eyes. Um, and since the gatekeepers are most of them are these, it means that uh, these are the lens that um, um, are, um, this is the way that Israelis consume the, the uh, media. You can see in, in uh, television shows, the host maybe would be a woman, but the experts would be men. You can see a uh, woman speaking about peace, about security, uh, being experts of, of issues that are not uh, womanly issues. Um, and if you talk about the Israeli militaristic uh, um, uh, society, um, this is what you see also in the news. This is the way it, it reflects on the news. So I'm going to ask you both two questions. Um, what do you think is your biggest challenge? I'll start with you. Um, just pick one. <laughs> 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 I think that, uh, um, like any other person in the business, I'm addicted to traffic. Our biggest challenge is to get to as many more to as many people as we can. Our biggest challenge as journalists is to build a sustainable model that can express that in which we can uh, uh, keep our independence, not be dependent on a single source, on a single political source. You know, you've, you've spoken about the Israeli media, the, Israeli me the, uh, the most widely read paper in Israel is Israel Ayom. It's owned by Sheldon Edelson. Uh, it's read by 40% of newspaper readers in Israel. And it's basically a local version of Fox News. So um, you go want to create independence you want to uh, and you want to reach as many people as you can and you want to maintain your uh, uh, political and personal integrity money basically money and money but money with no string attached yeah yeah i'm going to continue that with we're talking about language finding the way to communicate what we are talking about to people to to create this new uh, language uh, that is not just our own private activists' <laughs> language, uh, to communicate all these ideas uh, in a way that people would feel that we are not uh, coming from up, uh, to give them uh, the feeling that we are coming from the field uh, and we are expecting them to be part of it and not just consume it. Really interesting. One last question and then I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, uh, what do you, f he we're here in Washington, D.C., so what do you think is the most underreported story uh, that's happening, whether it's in Israel, Palestine, Israeli-Palestinian relations, it doesn't matter. Um, 
Do you want to start, Noam? What should we as journalists here be focused on that we're kind of not, not getting? In, uh, here in, in, in Washington. Well, in mainstream American In mainstream question. American media. Or whatever, however you want to take the question is fine. Um, I would say the story of Palestinians of 48. Palestinians of, uh, uh, um, in Israeli-Palestinian relations especially, I think there's a, there's a community of a million people and it's extremely, extremely difficult for a million people who are Israeli citizens and they're only present as part of a propaganda machine that says, hey, Palestinians are Israeli citizens, Palestinians go to Israeli uh, uh, universities, so what's the problem? But um, I think that uh, the, the lack of, uh, I always have to explain what is the legal position of these people or what is the legal position of Palestinians in East Jerusalem who are annexed to Israel, are residents of Israel, don't have full rights. And I think, and that's an enormous challenge even, even to begin a political conversation. So it was, it, and it creates all prob kind of problems along the way. Like it was very difficult to, to, uh, to, to speak in English about the, the, the proverb plan, a plan to displace Palestinian communities in the south of Israel, because people never understood that there were Palestinian communities in Israel, that there were, there were Israeli citizens, and at the same time they were threatened as Palestinians. They were threatened with regards to their rights over land and to the, to the indigenous, uh, indigenous rights of Palestinians. And I meet this challenge every, every, every other day, like connecting those. Yeah, I'll, I'm going to add to that that um, besides um, um, Palestinians inside Israel, there are many groups that combine the Israeli society uh, and just separate just the Palestinian issue from what's going on in Israel um, is, is um, making everything a little bit shallow uh, because the, as, as Noam said that our Palestinians inside Israel there are a, a, a large group of uh, uh, Russian uh, immigrants there is a, a the, the biggest uh, group in, in the Jewish society is a Mizrahi group um, and, and, and their struggle is, is getting more and more uh, loud in the last uh, in the last years um, and to Explain understand a little about that. What's the Mizrahi group? Okay. The Mizrahi group, um, Israelis came, uh, all Israelis came um, from different places in the world to Israel. Uh, the, the people that were uh, there first came from Europe, but then a few years later came people from, uh, Arab, from the Arab world. Um, there is, since they came, there is a huge discrimination uh, and a, a, a try to, to erase uh, the Mizrahi culture and the Mizrahi needs. And the means that uh, uh, Israeli governments through the, ho the whole years, it's, it's not just Netanyahu or any uh, uh, specific prime minister. Uh, during the whole years, this is uh, the way or the means that they uh, have been taken to um, try to erase their ad identities is pretty much similar to what's going on towards Palestinians inside Israel, for example, or other communities. Um, the struggles uh, uh, inside Israel, the economic situation inside Israel is very effective, uh, affecting what's going on. And, and to add to that, um, occupation is not just about rights and about land, it's also about money. Uh, and this is very, very important to understand. There are many people that are earning from having these separate groups that are fighting each other inside Israel uh, and, and that um, are kind of the, the, the lowest classes, if, if we can uh, frame it like, like that, uh, that can serve the way that Israel can continue existing like that. Um, there are many, many companies earning from the occupation. There are many um, different people that are, that are uh, earning a lot uh, from the situation. Uh, so not just talking about rights, but who earn from, from the, the situation right now. You mean, for example, like Israeli factories that are in settlements that employ 
Palestinians? Is that what you're referring it's, to? It can it be Israeli factories. It can be international companies. It can be a, a specific people that you know um, um, earn uh, from the situation. It can be if you look ab about at workers' rights, for example. I know this is something that is. Um, uh, maybe I have to explain. There, there are issues inside Israel, but differences between how uh, workers' rights are um, being treated inside Israel are different than it, uh, it happens in the, in the occupied territories. Uh, there is a gap between salaries, like what someone can earn inside Israel it can be 10 times than, than the salary someone will earn, earn in the occupied territories. Um, so we have a few million people that are living with a, with a, in a, under terrible conditions sometimes uh, that personally don't have a way to, to, um, uh, to earn or to um, move from this situation because you know they just lack of means. Great. Well, I think I'm going to open it up to questions. Let's take maybe two or three questions. Let's make them questions and not uh, statements. Um, or if you have something to say, just make sure that you frame it in a way that makes it sound like a really good question. We'll take three at a time. Um, over here. Sorry, there's a uh, mic coming your way. Um, hi, thank you very much. I, um, I'm going to try to squeeze in maybe two questions because I'm here sort of wearing two hats. Uh, my name is Allison Glick. And I'm with Jewish Voice for Peace here in DC. I also work for a whistleblower organization here um, in Washington. So uh, first to you, Noam, um, I was wondering if you could give a little bit of your perspective on this, this recent uh, revelation regarding the Jerusalem Post having to backtrack on this story about um, the Greek ship uh, that was alleged to be have been violated the Iranian um, the sanctions and the U.S. State Depa or the U.S. Department of Justice sort of stepping in and saying that um, nothing can be said more about this because it would reveal state secrets. I, I find it interesting that an English language newspaper in Jerusalem would be somehow involved uh, with this, um, especially given the connection to the Yuani group. So I'd like to hear your perspective on that, um, and if you've been covering that at all. And then also to you, Yael, um, the Unit 8200 whistleblowers, um, I was able to follow how 972 covered them, but I was wondering how Local Call covered them, and if, bo if you and perhaps both of you could talk about the response in Israeli society to those whistleblowers. Okay. Let's take another couple of questions. Sir, over here. Thanks very much. My name is Jonathan Levy. I actually work for the U.S. Federal Communications Commission, but I'm not here in an official capacity. I wanted to follow up on uh, Noam's answer to your question about the biggest challenge, because not just in Israel, but in the United States and many other countries, the economic business model for journalism is under substantial pressure. So I wonder if you'd be willing to get a little bit more specific about how you handle that challenge uh, in terms of you know, the range of, uh, of sources of support, whether it be philanthropy, whether it be sponsored events, subscriptions, whatever. Uh, I'd mm -hmm. be very interested in that. Thank you. Take one more question. Sir, over there in green. Um, my, my name is Max Kali. I'm from the World Bank, and I'm also totally not in official capacity. Um, uh, so the, my, my, I, I actually wanted to uh, you know, link back to what you said before about the reason why uh, there is such a consensus within the mainstream media, you know, and you actually refer to the white uh, Ashkenazi person driving it. But then if I think about a white uh, Ashkenazi woman, Catherine Gluck, I actually am not very hopeful. And if I think about uh, white or Mizrahi, uh, women in the Israeli parliament uh, uh, on the Jewish, uh, you know, in the Jewish party. I mean, you know, Tzipi Livni to name the most uh, prominent, but many others, uh, or Mizrahi Jews for that matter. I don't see this difference. I mean, I see that there is a, a monolithic consensus, especially when in, in terms of crisis and the Gaza war. Maybe I, I'm biased because I just read, uh, uh, you know, English language coverage, <laughs> but I'm actually, in a way, 
perhaps uh, asking you to, you know, pushing back a little bit on, on your uh, justification for this monolithic consensus and maybe, you know, ask you maybe to elaborate more on what else I is driving and why do people who actually step out uh, of line, not even of the uh, Zionist narrative, but just, uh, you know, within the Zionist narrative, I'm thinking about Gideon Levy, who is himself a self-professed uh, Zionist, you know, he, he had to have uh, bodyguards uh, during during his la latest war. And he, in fact, I, if I'm not mistaken, he's an, he's an Ashkenazi white. All righty. So let's start, Gail. We'll start with you. Uh, talk about the monolithic consensus. Um. In 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you refer to the last question. Um. Tipi Livni is a very good example because she's a woman will and, we will and, and I think that every feminist in Israel were expecting a high leap from her and it didn't really happen. Um, I think that um, the Israeli consensus is, everyone is in inside this consensus. It's right, you know, it doesn't matter from where you're coming or who, or who you are, this is the, the main uh, Israeli voice. Um, but uh, since there was, there are not enough, um, there is not enough room to develop a new uh, a way to speak about things, a new approach to speak about things. When people just know that if they want to get inside a consensus, they have to speak in, in in certain ways. You see that every time that when Tipi Livni is trying to say something else, everyone is bashing her. Uh, so um, I think that. You know, Gideon Levy is, is Ashkenazi uh, white man, but uh, he speaks just about a very specific issue in, in the Israeli uh, reality. He's not speaking about different issues, and this is what, I'm, I'm not talking about counting heads. Uh, it's, m it's very easy to say, we have uh, 10 women out of 20, we have uh, five Mizrahi, six uh, LGBT, we have more. Um, and, and, and to stay that way, I'm not talking just about counting heads, but about content, what we are talking about. If we are talking about Mizrahi issues or not, if we are talking about different ways of discrimination or not, um, it's very easy for it, the Israeli left dealt for so many years just with the discrimination of Palestinians. And I think that this is uh, part of what got us to where we are. Uh, if it's, it's very easy to speak about this, the discrimination of those that are there on the moon, outside, behind, behind the hills. Uh, and there is uh, different groups that are not, that are being discriminated and don't uh, get any attention to that. Uh, so when I'm talking about um, bringing different voices, it's, it's not just about who is speaking, but also what they're speaking about. Uh, for example, we really encourage women to speak about issues of uh, weapons, of uh, security, of peace. Uh, and this is something that um, women are not used to, to do. Uh, it's, it's a struggle um, and it's not coming uh, sometimes naturally from women to speak about these issues, but we insist to do it. Actually, right now we're publishing an article written by a woman about weapons in Israel. This is something that you can't uh, see. It's something you need to exercise. It's not going to change in a second. Um, so we're talking about identity, but also about the, the content, content itself. Noam, let's start uh, with the question about the economic business model for media. Well, if I had the flat answer, I would not say it here. I would sell it to someone. <laughs> and and uh, I can tell you what worked for us in 972. But I found that uh, I've been trying to learn this topic a lot. And I found that each organization should actually fit, it, it come up with its own model right now. Uh, what's right for the New York Times, a huge organization which has enough uh, 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 leverage to, to experiment is not right for a small organization in Israel, which you need to be better in adopting what's already successful. So um, for us, um, we began, at the first year, we, we, we didn't know what would be the financial model. After that, we understood it needs to be nonprofit. Um, it's very difficult to make profit of political journalism. Um, Nonprofit, 
just in an overview, we started with funds and we're gradually moving to public and to the micro donors and private donors who now make more than 25% of, uh, of our budget. If you're working on a strong political and moral commitment, you have a good chance of uh, raising money through micro donations, especially if your audience, like the left in Israel and abroad, feels that your, uh, its message is not heard within the mainstream. So I think what's encouraging, even in, Israeli, in Israel itself, we were surprised by the amount of donations we got from Israeli citizens, because Israelis are not giving micro donations as a whole. It's not, the col it's not part of the culture, but I think the feeling of alienation and marginalization on the left made people to give, to give for the platform. So, um, and I think that uh, uh, it will continue to be the mixture of, of both. Any other attempt, ads, third parties, content agreement, and all that, that, that was like pennies drop in the bucket. Uh, so let's go to the question about the Greek ship. Uh, well, I'm just going to avoid this one because I don't know enough, be, like beyond what you read, I, d I don't know anything like new to add to this conversation. So um, I'm ashamed to say that uh, I don't have anything to add on this. Yeah, yeah me too. Okay, yeah. let's go then to the question about but, the whistle. But the it whistle does sorry. highlight something yeah. that we're, we're stronger within the grassroots. We're stronger within the community. Uh, 972 doesn't have a military correspondent or in, in secret service correspondent. And, and I think that's part of our problems, but also I see it as an advantage. Because if you look at the Israeli media today, the Israeli media is covering the Palestinians primarily through military correspondent, which is incredible, I think, for to take uh, uh, predominantly internal issues and to cover it through the military perspective. That kind of en ends the story pretty much there. Even uh, we got a, a friend and a colleague from Haaretz here, and uh, Haaretz are different in, the sen in this sense. But even that, yesterday when uh, Haaretz was, uh, had a story about Shuafat, the neighborhood in Jerusalem uh, that saw some large-scale protest in the last few days, it was signed by the new military correspondent there. And the military is not even allowed in Shuafat. Shuafat is under Israeli law, and, is, and all the Israeli police operates there. So I, only, I don't only see that as a problem. I see it as an advantage that I challenge myself to do things differently. Really interesting. Any other uh, comments on the whistleblowers uh, in the Israeli? I think you're talking about the soldiers, right? This, the so um, I think that, uh, and yeah, yeah, El can add on that. I think that uh, um, what's interesting for me First of all, 972 and Local Call want to give a platform for the Israeli left and for Israeli dissidents and for Israeli uh, opposition, new opposition movements, because we think that out of it, the new narrative will emerge. So we felt honored and privileged that throughout the last five years, when people uh, uh, refused service, even if sometimes we agree with their reasons, sometimes we not, but they came to us. They published their statement on the site. They came with an interview. Uh, and so we want to give a platform for that. <coughs> Having said that, uh, uh, the, the story of uh, 8,200 unit, uh, uh, which is the Army Intelligence Unit that dealing with the, the West Bank, exploded in the Israeli national scene in a way that other whistleblowers that we've covered didn't. So it wasn't just in our hands, this, this story. I think that, and, and all of the criticism that was thrown in this group was that this was an elite unit, an elitist group that's kind of washes away its hands from the Israeli society and says, we're not part of the, of the game of control of the Palestinians. So we tried to bring it back to, and to say to people, listen to the stories these people tell. And listen to uh, and just one 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 story that they confirm that I've been we've been hearing all the time is about the the, the army intelligence use of uh, of sexual orientation of people within the Palestinian society to recruit informants. Now I've been hearing this story since the 90s, since my own military service, and it seems and and you can never print them because you can never be sure and it wasn't confirmed. So this was confirmed, so we try to highlight the fact the story that was a rumor was confirmed, and, and this is where we, we play our part, I think.
I actually only wanted you to maybe explain more to the audience what this issue is, since you've talked about it so Which in one? so the, much detail. The, the whistleblowers. What what is this story? Well, a, a, there's two elements involved here. First of all, there is refusal, and second, there is whistleblowing. A, a, refusal a, to refusal to serve uh, in in the in the West Bank. Uh -huh. Uh, which is a movement that exists within the Israeli left since 1967. Since the occupation, there were always Israeli, uh, uh, Israelis who refused to take part in the occupation. And the reason we've not heard about them is because 972 didn't exist back then. So, uh, <laughs> so we're here to tell you about them. Uh, um, and and, the, and uh, the refusal movement had peaks and had lows, and right now it comes out more in the form of public statement, like uh, I, I could say that I refused in uh, 2002, uh, but back then uh, it was uh, people refused on their own, and uh, and um, and, and uh, the army treated with them as, as as a violation of uh, of uh, of army conduct, of army laws, and and uh, but um, but recently it comes more as public statements, like a group of people get mm -hmm. together and sends uh, there were the pilots' letter and the, and the, the high school. Uh, 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 letters uh, uh, and and um, and this is the intelligent, the so-called intelligence uh, 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 letter, and this is the refusal part. But the, but this unique story, they did more. What they did, did more? the the um, the eighty two hundred uh, soldiers and officers who refused. They didn't just state we are will not take part in this anymore because it is against our moral values, but they also. S stated practices that are used by the army intelligence to mainly to recruit informers in Palestinian society. And I would and, and that I think what made it so controversial because people had all sorts of accusations of them, but I think this is something that actually opened some people's eyes. Uh, uh, I would just uh, end with another point, interesting point about that was what was most interesting in the letter was that they actually said Israel is using the same tactic that was used by secret police in, this, uh, in, in, in Eastern Germany and all that against their own citizens. So in Israel, um, Israelis came and said, how can you compare? We're in a state of war with another uh, entity and all that. And I think what was revolutionary in the letter was that, like, was saying, no, these are people under Israeli sovereignty. These are civilians under Israeli sovereignty. And they've been through under Israeli sovereignty for 40 years, for 50 years almost. And, and, and we're treating them, all of them, the entire Palestinian population, as enemy combatant or as potential enemy combatant. And we're using the same tactics that are used by the most authoritarian regimes against them, leading back to the question of who are the Palestinians? What is the Palestinian society? What is the real condition? What are their rights? What are their rights under Israeli sovereignty? And I think this was the most revolutionary aspect of the letter. If you want to explain the whole story, I'm, I apologize for interrupting, but to an American audience, if you want to explain, this same unit was the recipient of raw intelligence from the NSA, which was one of something that Edward Snowden disclosed. Um, unit 8200 receives raw metadata and content of US citizens' phone calls and emails by agreement with the NSA. So if you want to explain the story to me. But, but I think that's an American story. You it know, is, you know, you know is, I tried, I try in my, you know, Israeli and American politics interact in so many ways. I had, uh, in 972, I try really, really to, like, my, when I viewed Edward Snowden and what he revealed, I think that was a revelation. And it was interesting and exciting to read and, on, and, and made us angry and all that. But when we write, we try and keep a very local perspective, local call and local that, and we try to see what happens on the ground in the West Bank in Israel. Yeah, El, do you have anything to add to the Yeah, I, I, I can just say that uh, we knew that it's going to come before it happened. <coughs> this is part of what we, the connections we have and, and the trust we have inside the communities and lefty communities. We, know, we knew it's going to happen. And, and one of the things uh, we said from the beginning is that we're going to talk about the content and not about the people 
most of the media were talking about what they did on, or if it was right or wrong and not about the content. And, and as Noam said, uh, for me, I, was, I used to be Physicians for Human Rights, uh, Israel spokesperson a few years ago, and we were dealing a lot with uh, Palestinian uh, um, uh, people needing uh, medical care and me medical treatment inside Israel. And we were arguing for many years that Israel is using information about Palestinians and preventing them uh, to, to get medical treatment uh, if they are not helping the Israeli intelligence. And what they did was just to say, hey, you are right, you are not crazy, you are not just... And Palestinians, if, if, if they are saying, if you have so many evidence saying that this is what happened, well, sometimes this is what happens, even if the Israeli army is saying that it's not true. Great, let's go to some more questions. Renit. Thanks. So um, just a Ronit Avni, part of Just Vision. So just to ask, because you've mentioned Israeli left, but when we came together to launch Local Call, it wasn't, uh, we were talking about values that grounded the site, because the left can move in different directions and can situate politically in different mm -hmm. directions. So uh, I'd love for you to just talk a little bit about the, the values that undergird the site. Mm -hmm. Um, and then um, I think it would be useful to give people some granularity about um, what is the what are the statistics? What has the readership looked like? Um, mm -hmm. um, what did it look like over the summer? And what what's happening now? Who's coming to you and why um, at this point? But but I think especially for us at Just Vision, um, it wasn't a calculus about the left or the right or the center. There were just certain fundamental values um, mm -hmm. that we felt were really important. So I'd love to I'd love for you to share that, Laura. Mm -hmm. Hi, Laura Friedman from Americans for Peace Now. I was just curious if you could just address the question of journalism and the blogging element of it with um, censorship in Israel. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, over here. I'm, sh I'm Sharon Bender with B'nai B'rith International. Um, oftentimes American Jews in defending Israel will, will s go to the shorthand, well, it's the only democracy in the Middle East. Um, and of course, based on what you're both saying, obviously things are a lot more nuanced and, and difficult. Does that quick characterization that a lot of American Jews resort to undermine uh, Israel diaspora relations and undermine um, the work you do uh, and undermine Israeli society as a whole? Is it, is it hurtful? Great. Okay, so let's go to answers and then we'll take some more questions. So, uh, no, we got our values, censorship, and Israeli, <laughs> and Israeli diaspora relations, I think. <laughs> we can do that in a minute. <laughs> All righty. Um, where should we well, start? Let's yeah. let's start? Do you want to start with the values question? Um, not placing it in kind of the political spectrum, but rather in a values uh, basis. 972, um, because we believe in giving bloggers and communities the platform, we didn't like set certain uh, thresholds. Uh, we don't do tests for people. How do you test on, uh, on, on uh, certain moral issues? But. Um, but we did agree as a collective to some fundamental ideas, and I think the, and, and there are three basic ones. One of the, uh, the first one is the opposition to the occupation. We will, we, we, we will not recruit bloggers and writers who support the occupation just for the sake of conversation, because we won't have Palestinian partners, and because this voice is heard enough in Israeli mainstream. Uh, um, the second is a commitment to civil rights and human rights in the most acceptable in Israeli terms. So, so uh, uh, if you're on the side and you don't believe in gender equality but, uh, in, uh, or in the rights of asylum seekers, then uh, it, it creates, you know, it's not the normal uh, environment for 972 to, to operate in. Um, and the third is uh, freedom of information and uh, uh, opposition to censorship, which is uh, becoming a big issue in, the, in, the, in this day of age in journalism for various aspects. You know, you and I, uh, we all know the kind of constraints journal journalists live in. Uh, um, we can maybe speak a bit about censorship later. So these are the three elements that, uh, <coughs> that defines us as a group. More details. Uh, I'm going to uh, just ask you more on details of the readership before oh, I go. Readership, yeah. yeah, before I go to yeah, Alan, ask her about uh, censorship. So okay, um, who's uh, reading you? So I would separate the two because 972 and, and uh, local call are different in that way. 
Line 72 is now read by 80% uh, um, of people are reading that are reading it from the outside, from not from Israel, Palestine. Uh, the, the large majority, 40 to 45 percent, are North, coming from North America. Um, we see, you know, we see a lot of traffic coming from New York, uh, uh, LA, Florida. You'll tell me what those places have in common. <laughs> I have no idea, but <laughs> but uh, um, so. Uh, so I, and, and I think these are people, and we see, and the numbers are kind of in the hundreds of thousands each month, and it goes, you know, uh, towards the million in, in the war, and, and, and uh, when, so to speak, nothing happens <laughs> less, but no, there's not a dull moment in the, in the, in the place we come from. Um, in local calls, local calls were just launched before the war, so we kind of expected that we'll have six months with, uh, you know, hundreds of people visiting the site, and then we'll understand what works in terms of technology and what doesn't and all that, so, uh, and, and events get ahead of us, and, uh, and the site, again, uh, reaches, you know, the thousands to tens of thousands every day, and, and uh, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands every month, and, uh, and uh, we're very happy uh, uh, with this, uh, with this kind of engagement, mostly local, like 90% uh, uh, comes from Israel and, uh, and Palestine. We see a lot of, uh, relates to what uh, Yael said, a lot of Palestinian citizens of Israel following the site. And that was really exciting for us because there was a total separation of the media between the Hebrew speaking media and the Arabic speaking media. And, and uh, to see that come together, both on Facebook debates on the site and, and people sending texts uh, to the site was uh, really exciting. Great. Yeah, El, let's talk a little bit about uh, blogging and censorship. So if I can also say a few words about, about values, um, I think it's important, maybe it's something I didn't explain um, before, um, the structure, the way uh, local core was built is different to than the way 972 was built. In this, uh, in local core, we gather together just vision and, and 972 and active steels, and we were looking for people that would fit, with that will, will go with the, val the values we are talking about. So we're talking about values, no, I'm said, and, and a value of, of equality, and I think that this is a very important a, a, a thing to mention. So people that joined the project and mo all of them, most of the people in the project are volunteers. We can say that this is uh, maybe one of the biggest uh, volunteers projects uh, in the Israeli left right now. We're talking about, 40 f about around 45 people that are volunteering. Um, around 30 are writing. We have translators. We have some volunteering uh, editors. And, and they are all connected through those values. And this is what they're trying to promote. It doesn't mean that, that we agree on everything. Uh, you know, equality is something that you and me can uh, understand a little bit different, but uh, it means that we have something in common and everything is around that. I think that about censorship, Noam is the master. <laughs> well, um, this is a very broad issue, censorship in Israel. It begins with formal censorship. Uh, actually, you have a better person to speak about censorship and government harassment, like two rows behind you. Uh, um, but um, I'll tell you from my experience. Um, there's the layer of formal censorship in Israel, military censor and, and uh, the, the courts which uphold certain laws to what can be published and what not. I, uh, 972 and local call are not part of the censorship arrangement, which means that we don't submit pieces to censorship. Well, I'll tell you that as editors, we kind of submitted to the arrangement. And unless we will come across something that is really of uh, 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 journalistic importance, we try to follow the lines simply because of self-preservation. You cannot just go around saying anything, especially in a war, like um, in, during the war in Gaza, and expect to, to continue to work in Israel right now. Uh, personally, in my career, I met the censorship, especially as we were trying to uh, publish both in 1972 and uh, in Aretz when I wrote for the magazine, uh, a, an interview uh, on the nuclear issues with Dr. Avner Cohen of the, um, he used to work here, what's the, um, Montre Institute, historian of the, of the Israeli nuclear program. Uh, Dr. Cohen uh, uh, was not allowed to even to go back to Israel for 10 years because of his writing. Uh, right now he's allowed, but I interviewed him here in Washington on his last book, 
And the military censor simply blacked out parts of the interview. And I went back to, to him and said, you know, we're, you're, you're, uh, it's written in the book. Everybody knows this information. So he told me, you can cite the book, but you cannot discuss this in public. And so I think uh, the, the, mili the nuclear issue is a big black hole in the way it constructs Israeli history. For bloggers, it's not, uh, you know, because we don't sit in that proximity with the military, we, 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 we meet that less so. I think that the greatest challenge we face are arrests and army harassments in the West Bank. Uh, at 972, at one point, I could say that half the bloggers were arrested during, during the work. So, uh, uh, two photographers from Active Seal were shot in East Jerusalem. Uh, one of them suffered a, a metal rubber coated metal bullet to the jaw and spent how long in surgery? Uh, three um, surgeries. Yeah. Three surgeries and, and uh, another one, uh, Oren, the head photographer of Active Seals, had a bullet to the arm and, that, and he had a, another bullet like a few, few months back. The army does not distinguish anymore between writers and, 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 and protesters, especially not in places wh which in an urban environment, like inside a village like Nabi Salah or, or in East Jerusalem. We had uh, bloggers who entered Area A. We had one blogger arrested on the same day by both the Palestinian police and the Israeli police because um, uh, uh, he was in Area A where Israelis are not allowed, so Palestinians arrested them, and then he moved out to the West Bank, and then he was arrested by the Israeli military. We had a blogger put on trial for uh, uh, absurd charges by the military for covering uh, uh, protests from Nabi Salah. He was actually accused of joining the protest there. Um, personally, I think that both of our photographers and our bloggers express more and more concerns about their safety in the West Bank. Uh, in, in the aftermath of the kidnappings, we had events where photographers would say, I'm not going into somewhere without a bulletproof vest. I'm not going into the, in, into the West Bank. I'm not going into East Jerusalem without. It's still a privilege to be a Jew. You're better off being a Jew or an international than you're being the Palestinians, but it's getting risky to report there on the ground. So it's more than a censorship. It's a direct uh, threat. I want to say something about diaspora in one, one minute, and then maybe. Um, I experience Israel as a democracy from my position. I'm allowed to say most of what I want, and as long as I don't travel to Nabi Salah, I, I'm not in any risk. Most of my, uh, I, I exercise my political rights, I think, to the full extent. I write against the government all the time. I refuse military service in the West Bank, and I was punished for it, but, but I still, I, I, I can travel, I can speak. I do not experience it the way a Palestinian uh, experience it, not even a Palestinian citizen of Israel, but of course not a Palestinian of the West Bank. The decision to, to call Israel a democracy or not depends on the politics of the person. I, I experience Israel as a democracy, so Israelis have the habit of going around and saying, we live in a democracy because that's our life experience. But the Palestinian in the West Bank, and right now I have Palestinian friends because I work with Palestinians, uh, uh, experience Israel as an authoritarian regime, a dictatorship which might not be as bad as North Korea, but it's a very, a, a very harsh dictatorship. One where they don't have political rights, when they can be thrown in jail without any reason, and I've seen people get jailed without any reason. Any measurement of a dictatorship exists in the West Bank. So, and, and, and I think that um, by separating the issues and saying Israel is a democracy, with a, this diplomatic problem like uh, in the West Bank, American Jews make life very easy on themselves very, very easy uh, uh, on themselves. And, and I expect people who take any form of interest in the West Bank, I don't criticize Americans, American Jews who say, I'm an American Jew, my life is here, that's it. But any form of American, whether it's Jew or not, who take interest in the Middle East should view reality to the full extent of it, and the way everyone experiences it in uh, Israel slash uh, Palestine. Yeah, do you have anything to add on this question? Just to say that uh, we just had uh, in Tunisia uh, the second uh, democratic elections. So, and, and it's important to say it because 
things are changing in the Middle East. Uh, the democratic procedure that was, was very um, out there, the democracy is very out there in the streets, and this is what when I had the chance to interview some people from Tunisia uh, towards these elections. And I think that even now saying like, if you, con if you think that Israel is, 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 a, is a great democracy, just saying that it's the only one is, is just not uh, uh, fitting to the reality in the Middle East and, what's and the changes there. Let's take some more questions. Over there in the back. Thank you. Uh, my name is George Linzer. Uh, I understand from what you were saying, you've had some very good traffic to uh, the site. Uh, congratulations on that, especially so quickly. Um, I'm curious to know where that traffic is coming from and, and what you've done to generate that. Uh, you know, is it coming from search or referral, direct? Um, and then, uh, again, congratulations on the, on the New York Times picking up uh, uh, some of your work. Um, you had also talked about adding context to, to the story. Uh, does, did you find, feel that the Times picked up that context? All right, next question. Ma'am, over there. Uh, I was just curious to know if... Can you tell oh, us who you are? Oh, sorry, interested. my name is Ana Luiz. I'm a journalist from Brazil. Um, my question is, can you feel that all this traffic and all this context that you're able to bring to your readers, uh, did that change somehow the debate in the mainstream media and in the uh, Israeli society? Great. Last question? Or... Thank you. I'm Ori Nier with Americans for Peace Now. Thank you for a very uh, interesting discussion and uh, raises lots of questions. I'll ask one. Um, with the Israeli mainstream media, it didn't always used to be like that, obviously. There was a great deal of coverage uh, back uh, in the 80s and 90s, um, including television, a uh, great deal of, of, of coverage of the, the Palestinian um, society. Um, as I see it, there were, there were maybe three things that were different at the time. One was that Palestinians were much more open to Israeli society, and they have disengaged. The other is that Israelis were much more open and, and curious, and they have disengaged. Uh, and the third, which you talked about, was access, which today is, is very much limited. So my, my question, therefore, is when you think about, when you make editorial decisions, when you discuss you know, what to cover and so on, do you think about how to... Um, entice Palestinians to engage more? And more so, do you think about how to produce, how to generate stories that would percolate up to the Israeli mainstream media, particularly television, in order to have greater impact? So the, my main question is the latter, is the last one. Great. All right. So, um, yeah, El, let's uh, start with you. Uh, do you want to talk more about the debate in the main mainstream media? Yes. Yeah, so, First, yes. The, the answer is yes. Uh, we are aiming to, uh, for the stories to get to the mainstream media. We are not trying to be a bubble that is just having her own conversation. And we're, we are, um, you know, we're just lunch, we're just starting, but we, we, are, we see signs of success in that. Uh, we see other um, media outlets picking up stories that we've started and covering them. Uh, on the same way sometimes and, and taking it to their own place and this is something we really really encourage uh, on uh, one more thing that we do is that we encourage our writers to write for other outlets it's it's very important not to save them to keep them to, our, to ourselves and and to bring their voices to to larger audience uh, i think we can see um, maybe a good example was during the war we have we had a few bloggers uh, um, interviewing for channel two or for a few panels uh, for Channel 10, actually. Um, and they were talking about Israeli media and their role and, and the information that they can bring and, 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 and other outlets can't. Um, yeah, access, access uh, um, is, is one thing, and I think that the, the thing that changed uh, since 95 uh, is the, the separation, the, the larger separation between Israelis and Palestinians. And there, yeah, um, there is suspicion from, from both sides. I remember myself as a child 
growing up uh, and knowing Palestinians, knowing people from Gaza. My, my father used to walk from people from, uh, from Gaza. So Arabs were not the other that I don't know. Uh, and now kids and children are growing up without uh, knowing. I just spoke to, to a young um, um, a member of my family and asked her if she met any Palestinian ever. She's 10 years old. She never met. She never spoke to a Palestinian boy, girl, or growing up. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, uh, Noam, tell us a little bit about the traffic. How are you getting it, um, the traffic to the site? You talked about the locations, yeah, yeah. but not how people are yeah, getting but it. I'm going to refer to what Ori uh, finished. I, I view things a bit differently. I think, uh, in, uh, as I said, the reality of life is completely mixed in Israel-Palestine. And I think there are forces of integration, of separation, playing on the ground all the time. Uh, the separation wall is a force of separation. Um, economic forces play in both ways because Palestinians are moving into Jewish cities and Jews are moving into uh, more rural areas because they can't find apartments in, in the center of Israel. Uh, the settlements are a force of both. They create integration because they create one space, but they create separation because they come in a contents of Jewish dominance. So I don't think it's clear-cut question of, se of either the societies are more separated or more integra integrated. I think what's true is that the situation is way more dynamic. And when we speak on the status quo, the status quo is not static. And it affects our work. You know, some of what you could do four years ago to access a Palestinian in Gaza or to, ask, uh, to talk to a Palestinian in Ramallah is changing. It's changing because of the nature of politics. It's changing because of the nature of societies, of technology, of whatever. I actually, in many ways, see more access than I used to have. During the war, we got emails from people in Gaza telling us to, to, to asking us to, uh, uh, to publish their uh, war diaries on 972 magazine, which is cr incredible, I think. You know, an Israeli publication, which doesn't hide the fact that it registered with the Israeli authorities, and, 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 um, and, and they trust us, and there's a level of credibility enough for them to, to send us uh, their, their notes, and I think we try to deal with most respect to that. Um, sources of traffic. Um, Facebook. Uh, and Facebook. Facebook and Facebook. <laughs> in Israel, there is, Twitter is not a big platform for journalism as it is here in Israel. So the kind of cracks in the wall you can make with Twitter every now and then, it's not really an option. So you work with Facebook and you're in the constant chase against the Facebook, the elusive Facebook algorithm and, and how to promote your work. I think there's a strong element of personalization and, and engagement between the writers and, uh, and, and, um, and the readers, so the, the blogger-based model works in our favor here, and I think a lot of, personally, I think that blogging is not, there's like a debate whether blogging is dead or not. I think that the blog post and blogging as a form is what a journalistic piece is in this age. Like, I don't think there's a separation anymore. I think the blogging is journalism, and journalism will become blogging, and, uh, and this connection between the writer and the reader, uh, um, so I think uh, 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 on, the, on the social networks, we, we, do, we, we, we get a lot of the traffic uh, from there. Uh, in, the, in 972, uh, we view, we see the, the immense power of Reddit uh, when, they, when they pick some stories. Though Reddit is, uh, my feeling is, is quite liberal, but not that hospitable towards the Palestinian issue, I would say. You know, most of our stories that were picked on Reddit were kind of feel-good stories about Jews and Palestinians and Iranians coming together despite the rhetoric and all that, which are important, but, uh, uh, but then less of a political substance uh, uh, in them. And we try to keep uh, 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 direct contacts with our readers through a growing uh, e email list, which we put a lot of uh, effort and various other forms. I, I don't think you heard anything new there, but um, that's the mixture that we're trying to create. If I can add to that a little bit about the Hebrew site. I think that this it's a little bit different. And, and part of what we're trying to do, except what Noam said, is, is to cover different communities. People like to read first about themselves. 
Um, and, and, this is, and, and since we have people on the ground and we are reporting about different things that are happening in different places inside Israel and Palestine, we're trying to bring ver variety of, of options and of stories. So for example, if I was writing something about a village next to, um, in the center of, of, um, uh, of the country, uh, I went to visit there after I, r I wrote about them and everyone recognized me and knew what, knew what is local call because we wrote about them. We're trying to find ways to, to um, cover issues that are not just in Tel Aviv. Most of the media is sit cited in Tel Aviv or, or in Jerusalem and we're trying to get to the south and to the north. Where, where, um, uh, we will begin a project that will cover um, each, uh, each week a different place uh, in the country and, and it part of it is to bring the whole picture but also to get to new communities. Great. Before we wrap it up, I just have a question if you could briefly address it. We've been talking about kind of the um, response from, US, uh, from uh, Israeli media. I'd like to know what kind of negative feedback you've gotten. What are, when, when people don't like what you write, what do they say? Where are, you know, what's the reaction that's not only positive? Um, well, you get all, all sorts. You just pick, <laughs> your, pick your treat, you know. Uh, um, it starts from hate mail. and um, w What and is it particularly that they don't like is kind of where, what I'm curious about. We interviewed Hanin Zuabi. That's a yeah, good that wasn't very popular. The Israeli par parliament member that was uh, not only uh, ex expelled from the Knesset or stripped from her parliamentary rights for six months, also became the object of every person with a right-wing grudge in, in the Israeli parliament. So we, we basically gave her an open platform, and we did that because we felt her voice wasn't heard anyways, and we got tons of, of, of negative, negative feedback for that. Um, I think that people, I, I think that the war was a challenge. And, and, uh, and I remember that even during the, the previous Gaza escalation. I think that uh, th th there's a rallying to, to the flag and to the army at times of war. And uh, you know, the last operation in Gaza, it had between 87% and 96% support in the Jewish public. And, uh, and I think that, uh, uh, 972 and local call I think became the only Israeli platform that said pretty much openly, not because it was an editorial decision, but th that's because what the bloggers wrote, that they opposed the military operation, that they thought that there were alternatives to this war. And that was an extremely difficult position in terms of the reactions of the public. I just want to, I, I just want to put that in context. As I said, I think that Jews and, and Israelis still live in a free enough society to speak up their mind and to write. And there's a, and, and there's, there's a political challenge there to, to come across with this message. But it's something that can be done. It's not, uh, uh, I, I see Palestinians who try to come up with a message to the Israeli. It's much more difficult. I mean, we can open these doors. So I think the hate mail is, is not a big issue. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that uh, we get complicated reactions actually from right-wing uh, sites that are kind of our mirror sites. Um, so on one hand, they, they are really respectful for, for the work we are doing, but on, on the other hand- As an independent media. Yeah, as yeah, independent yeah. media and for trying like, and I think we, are, um, we respect them. It's legitimate to have all these outlets and say what you think and not just um, 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 stay behind the, the fake objective journalism uh, uh, thing that is, I this is a big debate in Israel if journalism is objective or not and, and so on. Um, I think that, that as Noam said, um, the people that get the most, uh, the, 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 um, the craziest reactions are, are the Palestinian writers. I think that one of uh, Rami, one of the bloggers that during the war wrote on, on almost a daily basis. Um, and we allowed him, allowed, we, we give him the space to say whatever he thinks. We are not censoring him. We are not telling him what to think or how to frame it. And the reactions were very, um, he writes very strong. So the reactions were strong. But one more thing that, you know, and this is something that people usually say about every lefty that is not uh, following the mainstream uh, um, narrative. 
and, and it's important to say, people can say that we are Israeli haters, and I think that the, we are coming from the complete opposite uh, position. I think that we are doing what we are doing uh, from a place of, of, of lots of love and, 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 and attachment and, and hope. Uh, and this is something you can't see or um, s something that people think that, you know, the situation is so desperate that you can't find uh, a single uh, uh, way out. And, and we feel that we can and we feel that it's, it depends on us. It depends on what we will do as Palestinians and the, and the, and the community. But it, it's, we have a lot to say about it and it's our job to change the situation. And with that thought, I think we're going to wrap it up. Yael of Local Call, Noam of uh, 972 Magazine, thank you so much. Thank you.